Newborn hearing screening really was very sporadic. There were a few people that knew that children should be screened and were attempting to do it with some behavioral technology or some physiology that was automated, but it was only here and there. People knew that they, children should be identified early, but it just didn't have much momentum. I'd say less than 5% of the newborns were screened in the United States. People were barely testing children at the age of two. We didn't have a lot of techniques. Um, we were developing some good techniques for children that were seven to eight months at that time. We were developing the brainwave testing in response to sound. And that's what really took uh, Dr. Thornton and I to the uh, area to say we could probably automate this for a screening um, instrument and that way people who had a lot of tr didn't have a lot of training could actually do the screening. The children develop language by listening and they listen for an entire year before they ever even say their first word. Because hearing loss is an invisible disability, people don't really realize that they're not hearing because children use other means to begin to understand or try to understand their world. And so the average age of a child coming in to be tested was two and a half. So these children were delayed in language, and this was a language delay that would affect them their whole lives. Newborn hearing screening has changed trem tremendously. It is now actually an accepted practice. When we first developed the ALGO, and you can see the old ALGOs behind me, we actually had it ready to be bought in 1985. But the, the practice of medicine, the practice of taking care of children, the practice of treating hearing loss was something that had to be convinced that finding hearing loss earlier than two was actually important. And so there was an aspect of the fact that we had to not only solve the technological problems, but we had to solve the social and the medical practice issues in order to get it widely accepted. And that took a lot longer than I thought it would because everybody agreed it would be a great thing to do, but to actually put it into practice took a lot of effort. And that was an effort that Natus was very key at, such that now people can't conceive that children were not screened for hearing loss at birth. A screening program needs to have a very good interface with the nursery to integrate well into the nursery. It needs to have personnel that understand what they're doing and do it easily. And they need to have an instrument that actually is very accurate and doesn't take a lot of um, training in order to get an accurate result. The next challenge of, of newborn hearing screening is really to get this worldwide. We still see children here who come from other countries who have not had newborn hearing screening and it's like I'm ste stepping back 30 years. And these children do not have the advantages of having been found early and having language. Well, I have had the privilege in my career of standing um, on either side of the divide of newborn hearing screening and, and the difference it has made in the lives of children with hearing loss. When I started in this field, and I was actually working in the brainwave testing with the ABR, the average age that I would find a child would be two and a half. And anyone who knows how well a two and a half year old talks knows that those who are not talking really have been hurt by the fact that they haven't had their hearing loss identified. Now at two and a half, these children are running down the hall with their Iron Man hearing aids, chattering up a storm. And most people are not even aware that they have a hearing loss and they are not limited by their hearing loss. We have prevented the problems that hearing loss causes when it's not identified. And that's the greatest joy of newborn hearing screening.